Well, we're continuing our series that's entitled Faith for Fractured Families. We made a beginning last week by laying this foundation that uh, Christian marriage is the union of two sinners in the process of recovery, and so you better expect there are going to be some problems and some tensions. Uh, we can add to that the Bible reality that uh, the children of uh, us recovering sinners are born with the principle of sin in them, and they find themselves therefore uh, in a battle not only with the enticements of the world around them, but also with the pool of temptation that is within them, as well as the assault of Satan upon them. And uh, the best children of the best parents uh, therefore will struggle and will make bad decisions. There are no perfect families. Now, the good news for us is that the Bible is full of fractured families who experience the grace of God. And what we began to see, I think, as we launched out into the series last week is that when you open the Bible, you very quickly see yourself there and uh, that God uh, speaks to each of us uh, in this way. Uh, The Bible is not a book of airbrushed saints. You know, there are some folks who get the idea that the Bible's some kind of a council of perfection that doesn't relate to the world today. But actually, when you get into the Bible, and that is what we're about uh, here week by week, uh, this is what you will discover, that it is filled with the stories of sinners who find hope in the amazing grace and the kindness of God. Now, we made a start last week by looking particularly at uh, a story in the life of Abraham, who we described as the flawed father. And today, our focus is going to be on Sarah, who I'm describing as the perplexed wife. Uh, Next week, it will be on Hagar, the single mother, and then in the last of this series on Ishmael, who is the troubled son. But today, Sarah, and I hope you have your Bible open at Genesis and chapter 18. Now, the first thing to say about Sarah is that she was a godly woman. Twice in the New Testament, she is commended. Once in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 11, where she is commended as a model of faith. Um, Second, in 1 Peter and chapter 3, where she is actually lifted up by the apostle Peter as a model for godly women today. In other words, in Sarah, we have Christian womanhood at its best. But as we're going to see in the uh, Scriptures today, even this godly woman experienced struggles with doubt. Uh, She engaged in manipulation that brought pain into the lives of other people around her. Sarah the beautiful, Sarah the godly, Sarah the woman of faith needed the grace of God in her fractured life, and if Sarah, who's held up as the model in the New Testament, needs the grace of God in her life, how much more is that true of every woman and indeed every man uh, here today? Um, The good news for us in this story is that God persevered with this fractured family. In fact, I think the further we get into this series, the more we're going to see just how fractured this family was. And at some point, it may come to your mind to say, why did God persevere with them? Thank God that He did. The good news of the gospel, the good news of grace, is grace means that God does not give up when people mess up. That is good news, isn't it? That's what grace is. God does not give up when people mess up. And that's why we've said in this series that Faith is for fractured people, and it is indeed for fractured families. So to Genesis and chapter 18, the outline is very simple today. Um, First, this is a story about hospitality. Second, it's a story about Sarah. And third, it's a story about God. We're going to find it's full of significance for all of our lives, men, women, married, single, today. Let's begin here then. It's a story about hospitality. Genesis in chapter 18, the story begins with Abraham sitting at the door of his tent. Um, uh, 
he lifted up his eyes, verse 2, and he looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. Now, try and picture this. Abraham at the front of his tent, and three men, they appear. Now, Abraham sees three men, but on three occasions in the story, we are told that God himself was appearing to Abraham. Let me just show you that quickly. Verse 1, the Lord appeared to him. Verse 10, the Lord said, I will surely return to you. Verse 13, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Now, if you look closely in your Bible, you will see that in each of these three occasions, verse 1, 10, and 13, the word Lord is printed in your Bible with four capital letters. And when you see in the Old Testament the word Lord printed with four capital letters, it means that the word that is being used is the Hebrew word Yahweh, uh, God Almighty, the great I am, this is the name of God by which he revealed himself to his people. And so, what we're being told very clearly on three occasions in this passage is that in this visitation, which was a visitation from heaven itself, God himself came to dinner with Abraham. And he talked with Abraham as a man talks with his friend, which is why later in the Bible, Abraham is described as the friend of God. Now, think about this before we move further into the story. In the New Testament, we are told that in Jesus Christ, God became a man. He assumed human flesh, taking human form, so that he remains the God-man for all eternity, and even now is the God-man at the right hand of the Father who is invisible, and he's there for us. But what we learn when we come to the Old Testament is that long before God became a man, God appeared as a man, making himself, in, uh, making himself visible for a short space of time in order to cultivate a relationship with people like us. And you find this happening many times in the Old Testament, especially early on in the story. It happened, for example, in the Garden of Eden, where we read that the Lord God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, taking a visible form so that he could communicate in, in a way that built a relationship with Adam and Eve in the garden. And here you have God doing the same thing with, with Abraham, taking a human form, appearing as a man. That is the form in which uh, Abraham sees God made present. We call this a theophany. And it's one of these wonderful gifts of grace that happened in the Old Testament. God appearing as a man, pointing forward, as it were, to the great center of salvation in which this would be fulfilled in God's becoming a man in His Son, Jesus Christ. And so, that's what we have here. God appearing as a man. Abraham saw three men, and so we are to understand that the Lord was accompanied by two angels also appearing in the same form, and that these three come and that they share a meal in the home of Abraham. Now, verse 2, when he saw them, Abraham ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. And he said, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Now, if you have sharp eyes, you'll notice there that the word Lord here is not in four capital letters. Here, it simply means sir or master, a term of respect. It's not the divine name. Uh, indicating, in other words, that Abraham probably did not yet realize that he was actually in the presence of God. What happens next is absolutely fascinating to me because it is very easy to imagine the domestic tension that it must have caused. Think of it. Three visitors arrive unexpectedly. Verse 6, and Abraham went quickly 
into the tent to Sarah and said, Quick, three seers of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. Now, folks, talk about fast food. I mean, what is this man expecting? But Sarah's instant bakery swings into action, and remarkably, the meal is very full, uh, soon uh, served. I tell you, uh, when I read this story, I am always reminded of the time during the first year of our marriage uh, when I had invited a friend to stay with us in London and then promptly forgot to tell my wife. Um, 11 o'clock one Sunday evening, I kid you not, the doorbell rang. Karen and I are looking at each other what in the world is going on? Who's at your door at 11 o'clock on a Sunday night? I go out, and then Karen heard me, my voice saying, Ah, Jim, ah, come on in. Ah, let me take your case upstairs to your room. And she's thinking, what on earth is going on? A few moments later, I come down the stairs to a perplexed-looking wife. I'm really sorry I'm saying I really messed up. I completely forgot about all of this. He's an old friend from Scotland, and he says he hasn't eaten since breakfast. Is there any way you can rustle something up? And uh, that was a moment in which I was shown amazing grace. <laughs> well, it was a little like this, I think, for Sarah, except that there was no fault on the part of Abraham. God simply showed up. The visitors from heaven appeared. God came. And I want you to think about this and try and take it in. God came to this fractured family. He came. And to this home in which there were all kinds of tensions, not exactly the place you would expect God to show up. I want you just to notice before we pass on in the story a bit further that Abraham and Sarah were blessed by opening their home to these visitors. It is very easy, especially in our culture, to shut other people out, uh, especially if your life or if your home is not as you would wish it to be. Here are other people, and they seem to have very fine homes. And you think, well, nobody would want to come to mine. Well, remember, Abraham's was only a tent, and God came. Now, that should encourage you. And maybe you think, well, you know, my life's a bit of a mess, so I, I really ought to withdraw from people. I need to hold myself back until I get myself sorted out. Remember the difficulties that Abraham and Sarah were finding themselves in, as we're going to see a little more uh, today. Um, and it was right then that God came to them. God does not wait until you've sorted yourself out. He ministers to us in the realities of life where we find ourselves. That's what grace is. And it's very significant that the book of Hebrews in the New Testament uses this story to encourage Christians with regards to the ministry of hospitality. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Why? For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Um, now, of course, that is a reference to Abraham and Sarah in this story here, which is an example. And he says angels because Christians should not expect a theophany. But what we can anticipate is that God will bless us as we open our lives to other brothers and sisters in Christ who will be like angels to us. In this sense, they will be like messengers from God who, who bring His help and bring His blessing to us even in our times of trouble. So, just before we move on, here's a very quick application. The first instinct when your life is fractured will be to withdraw. And I'm saying to you from the Bible, whatever you do, don't do that. Open your fractured life. Open your fractured home to others. And you may be surprised at how God ministers to you through them. So, it's a story about hospitality. 
Second, it is a story about Sarah. Now, I want simply to make two observations about this remarkable lady. The first is I want you to notice that unbelief crept up on this most godly of women. And she's a believer. In fact, she's a model believer. She is outstanding and known for her faith. But even for this woman, uh, unbelief crept up on her in a way that was hardly noticed until in this story it comes out. There's something important for us to learn there, isn't there? Verse 9, they said to Abraham, where is Sarah your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. The heavenly visitors, before bringing the message that they had come with, are making sure that Sarah is within earshot, because although they spoke first to Abraham, nonetheless, what they were about to say and the purpose of this visit was all about her. And so, with Sarah within earshot, God Himself speaks. Verse 10, the Lord said, Yahweh said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son and Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old. They're advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. Isn't that a delightfully discreet phrase? <laughs> She's past the menopause. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. And so, Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? Now, Sarah believed in God. She's a woman of faith. But she did not exercise faith in regards to this promise. Unbelief crept up on her. I do think that Abraham had some responsibility here, and let me tell you why. And here's something important for all of us guys. If you turn back just one page to Genesis in chapter 17, you will see that God had previously appeared to Abraham alone and had given him the promise that Sarah would have a son. And when in chapter 17, Abraham heard this promise, if you look at verse 17, of chapter 17, you will see that he laughed. He said, shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? But God pressed the promise on Abraham as the chapter continues, until Abraham came to the place where he believed. So, when now in chapter 18, Abraham is hearing the promise for a second time. He does not laugh, but Sarah does, which seems to me to indicate that Sarah was hearing the promise for the first time, which raises the question, why did Abraham not share the promise with her? Perhaps he didn't want to get her hopes up. And maybe it was that he did not think that she would believe it. But it seems to me that what we have here is a great man of faith who is looked to by many other people as a spiritual leader. He's the father of all the faithful, and the one place that he is not taking spiritual leadership is in his own home and in his own marriage. He has not shared the Word of God with the person who is closest to him. He has not cultivated her faith. Amazing. And perhaps that is why God does not rebuke Sarah for laughing, but He rebukes Abraham. The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? I've given you this promise, and I've trusted it to you, and I've trusted this woman to you, and you haven't even shared the promise with her? You've been asleep at the wheel, man. You have not been cultivating your wife's faith. 
Abraham, you have some responsibility here. Why is your wife laughing? But clearly, Sarah also has responsibility. Uh, here she is, this godly woman, a model of faith for Christian women today, according to the Apostle Peter. But even Sarah is struggling with unbelief, and more than that, she tries to cover up her unbelief before God. She's certainly responsible for that. Verse 13, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? And it seems that at this point, Sarah comes out of the tent. She's being spoken about. She now speaks directly to God. And the first thing she says to God is a straight-out lie. Isn't that amazing? She speaks directly to God, and the first thing she says to God is a straight-out lie. Sarah denied it, verse 15, saying, I did not laugh. And she hides the truth. Why? Because she is afraid. Notice that word in verse 15. She's afraid of what is happening in her own heart. She talks to God. That's what prayer is, right? But her prayer is a pretense, and she knows it. And God knows that she is covering up too. Unbelief crept up on this godly woman. And even when she's talking to God, there's a denial of the reality of what's actually going on in her life even while she's praying. Isn't that extraordinary? Do you recognize that? Now, my second observation about Sarah is simply this, that behind Sarah's unbelief, lay an extraordinary story of manipulation. So I, I think whatever you find unbelief, you want to say, well, now what's behind this? What led up to this? So the natural thing to do is one reflects on a story like this is, well, what came before? And if you just go back a, a chapter to the last main piece about, about Sarah, you, you get that in chapter 16. And that's where you find the story of Sarah and Hagar that we'll look at more closely next week. But let me just read these two verses, the first two verses of Genesis 16. Now, Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abraham, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go in to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. Now, here is a godly woman. Here is a believing woman. And she wants a child. Nothing surprising about that. She is prepared to go to any lengths to get what she wants. And there is absolutely no doubt in the biblical record about who is driving this. Look at what it says. Go to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children from her. And Abraham listens to his wife. And his union with Hagar leads to the birth of Ishmael. And now this already strained and fractured family is plunged into a web of conflicting loyalties and of hidden resentment. And the next thing that you find is that Sarah is struggling with unbelief. I was at the Gospel Coalition just uh, last week, and uh, in a message that Tim Keller was giving, he said, this is almost too crude to be used often. But he said, as a pastor who's very, very used to meeting with students who complain in one way or another about 
this or that struggle. He said, I've resorted on a few occasions when I've discerned it was right. And the students come back after the first year of college and the guy says, I don't know, I seem to be having a lot of doubts about my faith. Where are you worshiping? I don't know, I don't seem to have found any place I really like. How's it going with reading the Word? I don't know, I, I, I don't seem to be doing that very much. Keller said, I've just taken to saying straight out, who are you sleeping with? Who are you sleeping with? Walk in the light, Jesus says, and then you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. You move into the darkness, you don't know the truth anymore. And you're all at sea. Godly woman. And she's lost her bearings because she will go to any lengths to get the one thing she wants. So this story, the Sarah story, let me put it this way so that you can think about it and so that we can apply it. It is the story of a believing woman, a believing woman who uses her power to get what she wants in a way that dishonors God, and it brings pain to everyone around her. Now, I being very conscious of my limitations as a man trying to preach this message, I asked Linda Green, one of our women's ministry directors, for her thoughts on how Christian women today might use their power to get what they want in ways that dishonor God and bring pain for everyone else involved. That's what Sarah is doing. That's what the story is about. If we're to apply it to ourselves, that's a question we have to ask. And um, Linda reflected on that, and this is what she said, and I quote, women innately recognize that they have power over men and can use that to get what they want. She then suggested nine ways that married women might manipulate their husbands. Um, I am sure that this applies beyond the bounds of marriage, but let me give these nine to you. You ready for them? Number one, being a leaky faucet, complaining and nagging until he gives you what you want. Number two, intimidation, out-talking him and shutting him down with her verbal skills. Number three, making her husband feel like he is responsible for her unhappiness, anger, and sadness. If only you made more money. If only you were home more. If only you had a better job. Number four, expecting him to read her mind, but giving little in the way of clues. Sighing, pouting, giving one-word answers, but when he asks what's wrong, saying, nothing. Number six, five, banging pots and pans around in the kitchen to make the point that you are doing the dishes without just coming out and asking for help. Number six, tears. Most men don't like to see a woman crying, so even when he thinks he's right, he'll usually soften to stop the crying. Seven, withholding sex or using sex to get what she wants. Eight, laying guilt on him, telling him how disappointed she is in him. Nine, making him feel inadequate. Quote, we are the only ones I know who have not been to Disney World. <laughs> well, ladies, you must take it from a sister in Christ and seek to apply into your own minds. There are ways across gender in which we can use power to get what we want 
in a way that dishonors God and brings grief and pain to all around. And in the life groups, if you're discussing this, you might like to talk about some more ways that could be added to the list and how by the grace and the mercy of God we may move beyond them. This is what Sarah was doing. And the, the effect of it really crept up on her. And one of the manifestations of it, it seems, in the very next story is that uh, we find herself, we find her in this extraordinary uh, unbelief. Now, a story about hospitality, a story about Sarah, and here's the last thing that, of course, is so important. It is supremely a story about God. And just these observations in these last minutes. First, I want you to notice that God comes near to Sarah. This woman has been using power to get what she wants in ways that dishonor God and are bringing pain to people all around her. God comes near to this woman. The conversation, of course, had initially been with Abraham, but the purpose of the visit is quite clearly the promise to Sarah. You picture it at the beginning. Sarah stayed in the tent. She's, she's uh, hiding there. She is not coming out to meet with God. Perhaps she was embarrassed by the weakness of her faith. Perhaps she was ashamed by the knowledge of her own manipulation. And maybe you know what that feels like, man or woman, People see you as a leader. They, they, they look to you. God has given you responsibility and trust in ministry. And when you look into your own soul, you say, well, now what would people think if they knew how threadbare my faith really is? Have you ever said that? And here's the good news. God knows how threadbare your faith really is. Nothing is hidden from Him. He knows your worst thoughts. Nothing about you comes as a surprise to Him. He has set His love on you, knowing you at your lowest and knowing you at your worst. And He does not give up when His people mess up. That's grace. See, here's what happens in relationships so often. You know this story. Boy meets girl. They see each other for a period of time at their best. And then both of them think, oh, this person is something special. So they get married. And from that moment on, their lives become what? An exercise in trying to make sure that the other person doesn't actually find out what was successfully hidden throughout the entire courtship, right? But God set his love on you, knowing you at your worst. That means that the presence of God is the one place where you are completely known and nothing is hidden. And in Jesus Christ, you have no reason ever to be afraid. That's marvelously liberating the one place where you are totally known and you have no reason to be afraid in and through Jesus Christ. And, and the Lord comes to this woman. And what does he do? He exposes her unbelief. This is what the Lord will do in your life as he draws near to you. Sarah laughed to herself, verse 12. Notice that she did not laugh out loud. It wasn't that the visitors heard her laughing. She just laughed inside. She laughed to herself, and she's inside the tent. As far as Sarah is concerned, her unbelief is a private matter. I'm just sitting in the pew, and nobody knows what I'm really thinking. It's just inside me. No, God knows what you're thinking. God knows all your questions. He knows everything that's going on in your mind right now. Sarah assumed that nobody knew what was happening in her heart, but she had not reckoned on the fact that she was in the presence of God. God knew. He sees all things. Nothing is hidden from him. And this God loves her and loves you at our worst, your worst, and he will not leave you at your worst. He exposes what is going on in this woman's heart. Why? 
so that as her unbelief is exposed, her faith may be restored. You say, how do you know that uh, Sarah's faith was restored? We know it for this reason, that in the book of Hebrews, we read that by faith, Sarah received power to conceive, to conceive by faith. Even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Now, the Lord appeared in Genesis 18, specifically a year before the birth of Isaac, so she conceived there for very shortly after this event. And the book of Hebrews says she conceived because she considered him faithful who had promised. That's how you know that this woman's faith was wonderfully restored, this godly woman who had come to this place of, of doubting and unbelief. It's restored through an encounter with God. And that just leaves me saying, well, now how is a person's faith restored through an encounter with God today? And it's just very obvious here. How is faith restored? How can your faith be restored when it's threadbare? And the answer, very simply, at the end of this story is you have to look to who God is. That's why it says, is anything too hard for the Lord, four capital letters. Sarah struggled with unbelief. Why? Because her eyes were fixed on old Abraham and on herself. And she's rightly thinking, this guy's no use. He's a hundred years old. It can't ever happen. And as for me, I'm not much better. I'm only ten years lagging behind him in ninety. It ceased to be with me as it is in the way of women. It's not going to happen. And as long as you're in a situation looking at the person God may have placed next to you and all of that person's limitations and, and all of the cluster of factors that are part of human life, you're going to find yourself in a, in a despair and going more and more and more into unbelief. And, and what does the Lord do here? He, he he moves her gaze from being consumed with herself and the limitations of Abraham. And he says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Hope does not lie with you, Sarah. Hope lies with the Lord. As long as you're looking at the weakness of your own faith and the difficulties and the pressures of your own life and the problems of your own spouse and the difficulties of your own children, you will find yourself sliding into unbelief. When God speaks to Sarah, he lifts up her gaze away from herself and is anything too hard from the Lord? That's why we look up to the Lord in worship. That's why we come to look at the Lord through his word, because that's how faith is restored. Look to me. I'm the sovereign creator. I'm the great I am. I'm the king eternal. I'm Yahweh. I am who I am. Faith grows as you get your eyes off yourself and the failings of others who are around you and on to the living God and not only to look to him but to listen to him. Because God repeats this wonderful promise specifically to Sarah, verse 14, at the appointed time I will return to you about this time next year and Sarah shall have a son by the way, for the relief of any 90-year-old women in the congregation today, the promise for us is not that senior and retired ladies will be having children. That is not the promise for us. Seriously, actually, because um, there are younger couples who long for a child and sometimes get a confusion in relation to this story and make a direct jump that should not be made. Uh, this is the promise that was given to Sarah. The question then is, how does it speak to us? And the answer really is very simple, and it's this. The revealed purpose of God for Sarah involved the birth of a child, and given that she was in old age, it did seem like she might actually miss out on what God had planned for her. That's an awful thought, by the way, isn't it? Have you ever thought that? You make some turn and twist in your life, something happens in your life, something that you didn't expect occurs, and you say, am I going to miss what God intended for my life? 
Is my whole life going to be, you know, on train B when I should have been on train A and all that kind of stuff? Dreadful thought. And the point of this promise to Sarah, and it comes directly to us here, is very simple. Sarah, God's purpose for your life will be fulfilled. Despite all the twistings, all the turnings, all the disappointments, all the failures, all the sins, God's purpose for your life, Sarah, will be fulfilled. Everything that God has planned for you, Sarah, will be accomplished. Even though right now you cannot see how that could possibly be. It has to be a matter of faith in me. But this is the promise. And you can take that directly into your own life today. You look at your own life and you will see twistings and you will see turnings and there are disappointments and there are failures. But here's the promise for you, put in New Testament terms. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Everything that God has purposed for your life will be accomplished, and He works in all things, even the worst things, for the accomplishing of this ultimate purpose, for your ultimate good. He does this for all those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. And here you are single, and perhaps you long to be married, and you say, is it going to happen? and it becomes a focus of tension for you. And I'm saying to you from the Bible today, everything that God has planned for your life will be accomplished. And here's someone else, and you're married, and you're wishing that the marriage was different from what it is. It has not been what you thought. It has not been what you expected or what you hoped. And I'm saying to you, everything that God has planned for your life will be accomplished. Here you are, and you're stuck in what feels like a dead-end job, and there's all these hours, and years are passing, and, and it feels to you like you've missed something. And I'm saying to you, on the basis of Scripture, everything that God has planned for your life will be accomplished. I did not say that everything you have planned for your life will be accomplished. But on the authority of the Bible, I say to you today that everything that God has planned for your life will be accomplished. And so don't go through your life saying, everything God has planned for me will be accomplished if my husband shapes up. Everything God has planned for me uh, will be accomplished if we have that longed for child. Everything that God has planned for me in my life will be accomplished if I get a more satisfactory job. Don't go through your life saying, everything for God, uh, that God has planned for me in my life will be accomplished if I meet that perfect person. I long to meet the perfect person of my dreams. No, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus, period. No ifs. That's what the sovereignty of God over a Christian's life is all about. And that's why the dysfunctional story of Abraham and of Sarah becomes a story of hope for every person who is in Jesus Christ and for every broken family that needs to know this same wonderful, wonderful grace. So let's take this away from the story of Sarah Whenever you spot manipulation in your life, quit it. Manipulation is using your power to get what you want in a way that dishonors God and brings pain to everyone else. Learn to recognize manipulation and be done with it whenever you see it. Confront unbelief. Remember that unbelief grows in darkness. It hates the light of day. Confront it. Don't ignore it. Quit pretending and recognize unbelief for what it is. Refuse to be false before God in the place of prayer. He knows everything about you. Why would you not tell him everything as you come before him today? Lay it out. There's nothing that can surprise him. It's completely safe for you to do. And grow through grace. There's a wonderful verse that I love that David repeats twice, once in 2 Samuel and once in the Psalms. He says, your gentleness, O God, made me great. Your gentleness. God was gentle with David. God was very gentle with Sarah. And God will be gentle with you 
He knows everything about you already. So why would you be afraid to come to him in all of your need today? Father, we're amazed at the grace that is in the Lord Jesus Christ shining to us from the earliest part of the Old Testament. And of all of our need, we are so grateful for the gentleness of the Savior who bids us come and who reaches out to us now, even in love and mercy and grace. And through him we draw near even now in Jesus' name.